I'd love to just jump back on what it was like growing up inside that environment of junior motorsport, because, you know, with the popularity of, of modern Formula One, people look so early on into drivers' careers as who might be the next prospect, what could happen if you take a, you know, a Formula Renault Euro Cup or, or those sort of things going on now, FIA Formula 3, everyone's so excited to look at, well, how early can we get these guys started? And I think particularly with Verstappen, right? He jumped straight from from a international Formula Three to his Formula One seat, and it's talents like that that really draw the eye to the junior formula. Um, but what was it like growing up inside a, a motorsport environment there? How did you kind of balance that competitiveness and how different it really was to how most people grow up? I guess. Um, it, it, I don't think the teachers at my school liked it that much. If, if I'm being honest, <laughs> because there was you know plenty of Thursday and Fridays that I should have been at school that I wasn't. Um, don't necessarily advise that. I mean, try and find a, a way, a way to continue studies if you're if you're racing, if you want to start racing and still at school. Um, but um, it was a yeah, it was difficult to juggle it. But um, when you sort of know that it's all you ever want to do, it's you've got to focus on it. And you know, suddenly if you if you if you haven't focused on it and if you don't want it enough, then it's no point doing it basically. Um, and you find that out soon enough because you if you get to um, in my in my case like British Formula Three, and you're suddenly racing against people that have gone on to uh, be race winner or championship winners in Formula One, you realise how brutal it is. And if you haven't thrown everything at it at that point, it's going to be a waste of time. It's going to be tough. Um, and um, you've got to factor in the the, the amount of budgets that you're throwing at it so you've got to be you've got to be giving it everything you've got at that point yeah and it seems like uh the one of the biggest storylines in junior motorsport is that funding battle and how drivers can attract sponsorship and, and all that kind of the business element to it there would you say that one of the biggest kind of elements of success in those junior categories actually happens off track and there's a lot of learning that has to be done early on to really succeed not only on track, but managing the environment uh, around the track, your relationships with sponsors, attracting new sponsors, that whole sort of thing. How did you learn about that firsthand in, in your time in junior racing? Um, it was, it's difficult. And um, it's probably the part of being a racing driver I dislike the most, if I'm being completely honest. Um, it's it's really difficult um, because um, you're, you're new to motorsport at that stage. You're you're new to how to go and find sponsorship. You've had minimal training in 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 that. Um, in my case, <laughs> I was I was trying to trying to get some big budgets to do GP2 right at the time of the financial crash in 2008, which was um, which made it almost impossible. Um, but in a normal world, it's still very difficult. And um, yeah, you, you just have to to grow up very quickly and work out what these companies that you're talking to actually want because you know when you're when you're starting out you think it's just a sticker on the car i mean actually that's almost irrelevant to a lot of the companies you'll, you'll be talking to to try and get sponsorship it's more about how can they entertain their their clients um at the races and how can you deliver on that professionally and do it properly um, and that's an area of being a racing driver that you really have to crack. Um, the second biggest, I think, um, is, um, is, like I say, it's a people business and you need contacts. If you're um, very new to motorsport, you probably won't have any and it's really difficult. And one thing I'd say to any aspiring young driver is just go up and talk to people. Um, they, 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 nine times out of ten, they'd be very generous with their time and um and don't be nervous just get their advice and it doesn't matter who they are you also recognize them as a i don't know a le mans driver or team boss in formula one or f1 driver whoever it is go and talk to them you never know where it's going to go where it's going to lead who they might help you with if, if if you get on well with them um and um it, it's those contacts are going to be absolutely vital um uh, I used to find it quite funny with with some of the drivers that I raced in Formula Three that had uh, connections or family members that were ex Formula One drivers or something like that, and they they always said, "Oh, the pressure of is so intense because I've got to live up to my father's sort of um, career." But actually, they they I don't think they ever really realised 
the advantage they also had um whilst i was spread the, the pressure they were under the the contacts that they were sort of just given um were were actually just just gold i mean it you can't replicate that in such a short time when you really need those contacts in formula three um you know they, they had them on the plate so absolutely vital that side so yeah it's sort of um yeah, the, the 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 talent will only, will only get you so far. You've got to put the the hard yards in with with sponsors and uh, contacts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd love to know more about your time in in British Formula Three. You mentioned it was an extremely competitive time for the series. Um, are there any races that particularly stand out to you, or moments where it was a really intense situation? And yeah, how did you how did you kind of resolve that? Or any any kind of standout memories? your time there it sounds yeah like um so of. i started uh british formula three in 2005 um and that was in what we what they call the national class or b class which was slightly older cars um performance is almost identical to the the, the international a class cars but um it was slightly less budgets and also you could have the potential to impress people or uh, which hopefully would get you a better deal for the, the the next year so that was the sort of idea of doing it um i was i was really lucky to drive for alan dock and racing who um have they, they ran loads of top drives in their time mick asylum um mark weber um oh wow a few other people earlier but just before me obviously um and driving for alan was was just the, not only a lot of fun but he taught me a lot about how the world works and how motorsport works and um i look back very fondly on my time driving for alan for in 2005 and, and six um and then, yeah, 2007, I I drove for Double R Racing, or at that time it's called Raken and Robertson Racing, which is Kimmy's junior team in, in British Formula 3. Um, and I think that propelled me to be a real front runner in the championship, um, you know, pole positions, race wins, and um, I think it was fifth in the championship, if I remember rightly, a long time ago now. Um, but I, I really enjoyed that time, and um, it... I think anyone that was around British Formula Three then will recognise that if you if you could excel as a, a Formula Three driver in the UK, you could probably get away with doing almost anything else after that. What it would teach you, um, the laps that you would do, not just in racing but in testing, was was huge, um, and. Um, the, the cars themselves, most of the drivers were driving Dallaras. There were Lolas and Miguel's there at the time. Something you don't get these days. You know, it was an open formula that you could bring if you wanted to. Make oh wow, own, yeah. Could, you could make your own car and off you go. You know, as long as it hit the regulations. And um, yeah, I drove Dallara for all three years that I did, and and in my book that was the best best car to have at the time. Um, but you could do anything you you wanted with it. Um, you know, if you wanted to make a new front wing or rear wing, up to you. Most teams didn't, because why would you try and do that when Delara have done their own thing? But some teams did. And I really enjoyed, enjoyed that side of it. There's a lot of technical developments. Um, and again, you know, if you're trying to train the driver to be a Formula One driver, which is what we were all trying to do, what better place to do it? You know, it was... Um, it was really good, good fun times. You know, it was there were no paddle shifts or anything like that. It was still a sequential gearbox. Um, really light cars are probably 100 kilos less than they are now, or maybe more. I don't, don't actually know what they weigh now, but you know, they're really fun, good cars to drive. Um, and of all the drivers I raced against, I think if you had them here for an interview like me, I think everyone would look back very fondly as driving those cars. Um, uh, and uh, you know, they, they were. They taught you everything you needed to know about being a racing driver and, and the techniques that you you learn not just in terms of racing but in terms of how to race them and the technique that's required i i don't think i've really i've, I've developed but i don't think i've really changed anything from that time as a driver in terms of how i drive um it teaches you everything you want to know 